Baik, kita mula. Uh, jadi uh, kita uh, uh, mulakan uh, sesi uh, uh, syarahan tanah air. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, selamat datang uh, ke, uh, ke sesi uh, syarahan tanah air. Uh, untuk kali ini, ini ses, uh, syarahan yang ke-9 uh, dan kita uh, telah berehat selama uh, dua bulan actually, sebenarnya. Uh, jadi kita sambung semula untuk uh, syarahan yang ke-9 dan kita seterusnya uh, syarahan akan diteruskan tiap tiap bulan uh, sehingga uh, bulan Disember uh, tahun ini. Jadi uh, pada kali ini kita telah menjemput uh, seorang uh, uh, sarjana yang 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 terkenal uh, yang uh, begitu aktif sekali dalam uh, uh, apa, berkaji dan menceritakan mengenai uh, uh, sejarah kedah tua dan ini amat penting kepada naratif uh, 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 masa lalu negara. Uh, untuk uh, menegakkan uh, apa penemuan-penemuan uh, uh, dan juga uh, budaya uh, serta uh, landscape uh, pada masa lalu dari segi apa yang telah berlaku di Kedah, apa yang telah berlaku dari segi penemuan-penemuan uh, uh, candi dan tadi disebut uh, poteri uh, di uh, di sebelah uh, berbu uh, 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 peni uh, sungai sungai uh, kawasan sungai tua dan sebagainya. Uh, uh, Dr. Nasha uh, bin Rosyadiko uh, ialah uh, seorang pesyarakanan uh, uh, dari pusat uh, pendidikan ekologi global uh, Universiti Sains Malaysia. Uh, Beliau uh, uh, menerima ijazah Bachelor of Science Honours dan Master of Arts dari Universiti Sains Malaysia uh, dan uh, PhD dari Universiti Peshawar, uh, Pakistan. Beliau telah mengkaji uh, yang, yang saya faham uh, penemuan-penemuan uh, arkeologi di uh, lemah Indus dan beliau mahir dalam uh, bahasa Sanskrit dan uh, uh, Urdu. Uh, dan uh, Dr. Nasha telah uh, khusus dalam uh, bidang uh, arkeologi sejarah uh, dengan uh, pendidikannya bertumpu kepada uh, zaman modern awal negeri-negeri Melayu dan epigrafi paleografi dan tajuk yang yang Dr. Nasya telah pilih ialah Ancient Kedah as a Maritime Polity Reassessing Historical and Archaeological Sources dalam banyak ceramah yang diberi oleh Dr. Nasya Uh, kita dapat lihat bahawa apabila uh, kita bercakap mengenai masa lalu um, dia uh, tafsirannya berulang-ulang tafsirannya mungkin berubah dan uh, kita tidak boleh uh, mengandaikan bahawa satu yang ditemu itu sama ada dalam bidang arkeologi atau dalam bidang sejarah itu merupakan fakta dia ber- mungkin merupakan fakta pada masa itu Uh, tapi uh, uh, kefaktaannya uh, boleh berubah mengikut zaman dan mengikut tafsiran uh, apa pada masa kini terhadap masa lalu. Jadi ini penting untuk kita menilai sejarah uh, dan dan apa yang telah berlaku pada masa lampau. Apa yang telah berlaku pada masa lampau memang berlaku. Tapi tafsirannya berbeza. Dan inilah yang kita rapi dalam mengkaji sejarah uh, Malaysia uh, 
zaman moden uh, dan zaman awal moden uh, terutama sekali apabila negeri-negeri uh, Melayu sebelanjur tanah Melayu uh, bertemu dengan dengan kuasa-kuasa uh, uh, atau bertemu dengan orang-orang uh, uh, Eropah uh, pelbagai-bagai uh, insiden telah berlaku namun uh, uh, kita perlu semak semula apa yang telah berlaku, mengapa ia telah berlaku ataupun ia tidak berlaku tapi di, difaktakan bahawa ia telah berlaku sebagai satu contoh uh, pertemuan orang putih uh, dalam konteks Pulau Pinang dan Kedah jadi uh, dengan itu uh, uh, kita menyebut Pak uh, Kutulasya untuk uh, uh, berkongsi uh, Uh, kajiannya uh, dalam uh, sesi uh, syarat sembilan sembilan uh, projek uh, maritim uh, projek tanah air uh, peradaban maritim Melayu. Uh, dengan itu saya serahkan kepada Dr. Asya. Yeah. Baik. Uh, Assalamualaikum, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning. And uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank uh, Professor Murat Merikan for having me here. I truly appreciate and applaud the efforts taken up by ISTEC in organizing this lecture series, which I think will encourage academic discourse among scholars and the public alike on the topic of our maritime past. I also believe that this program can be able to increase public awareness regarding the never-ending academic debates on our history. So, the Center for Global Archaeological Research, University of Science Malaysia, is the only academic institution in this country which gives special focus on archaeological research. We have been carrying out studies on various sites dating back to the prehistory up to the colonial period. One of our studies in the research on early maritime period of Malay Peninsula, yeah? and among the sites which we are currently studying concerning this topic included the Sungai Batu Archaeological Complex, the site of Bukit Choras, the site of Berwas Perlis, as well as those found in Aceh and Berwas. And one of the most intriguing research subject during this period is the study of the history and culture of ancient Kedah, a topic which I will be covering today. And due to the limitations in terms of data and sources, this research had opened the room for different forms of interpretations, leading up to the presence of various trends of narratives. So I will be presenting on the maritime past of ancient Kedah from our point of view, and we'll begin by explaining the historical context of the Malay Peninsula within the larger and diverse cultural context of the Malay Archipelago. So firstly, we need to understand that the Malay Archipelago is an extremely diverse region, covering a large area with wide range of natural features. Places such as Sumatra, the Malay Peninsula, Java, Borneo, Sulawesi, etc. had different forms of geomorphological configurations and environmental setups, ranging from fertile volcanic plains which can sustain large population to sparsely populated riverlands and dense tropical forests. Some are strategic located near to the trade route, while others are quite isolated. Even for the demography of the Malay archipelago, some areas have large and settled agrarian population, while the rest are quite mobile coastal population. As a result, the societies living in different parts of the archipelago had distinct forms of development, forming different cultural attributes and different reaction to external cultural stimuli. For instance, when we speak about Indianization, it may have happened in Java, Sumatra, and Bali, but less so in the Malay Peninsula, Borneo, and Sulawesi. So we must not paint the whole Malay archipelago region with the same color. Yeah? And uh, we should interpret our history and culture according to the specific local parameters which influence cultural change in the certain areas. So among the parameters that we should consider included the demography aspect the geomorphology, economy, ecozone, and location. So, the Malay Peninsula had some peculiar combination in terms of the geomorphological configuration, environmental setup, 
geostrategic position and uh, uh, demographic distribution leading up to the distinct form of political and cultural development throughout the different epochs. So the Malay Peninsula consisted of a rugged interior covered by thick rainforests, while the coastal areas are mostly covered by inaccessible mangroves with limited space of dry and, uh, dry and flatland. And the Malay Peninsula is crisscrossed by a riverine network huh, connecting the coastal areas with the interiors, with the estuaries and riverbanks becoming important knots for settlements. So as a result, the Malay Peninsula it cannot be able to sustain large agricultural and sedentary population yeah? as compared to Java and Bali, where, where, where most of the settlements in the Malay Peninsula, they focus around the coastal and riverine areas. And in these areas, it cannot be able to sustain for more than 50 to 70,000 people at one time. Yeah? However, despite of the lack of agriculture, the Malay Peninsula is positioned as a barrier between the Indian Ocean and the South China Sea, putting it in an extremely strategic location. So the presence of river estuaries alongside with the inhabitants enabled the local traders to stop by for supplies. And thus, instead of agriculture, the economic stimulus which triggered social change in the Malay Peninsula was trade. So it was international trade which caused the dynamic shift of the societies in the Malay Peninsula from the prehistoric society to a historic society. So it was the economic stimulus driven by trade. So as far as the Malay Peninsula is concerned, we can generally divide our cultural and historical periodization into three main periods. Firstly, is the prehistoric period. Secondly, the proto-historic period. And thirdly, the historic period. Yeah? And there are intense debates on how that these three epochs should be defined, where I believe it has to be based not only on their time period, but also on their cultural attributes. Yeah? So firstly, we need to look at the prehistoric period. So the prehistoric period can be dated from the moment human beings started to appear in the peninsula up to the 500 BC. And the prehistoric period in the Malay Peninsula is characterized by the development of the Paleolithic and Neolithic culture. Yeah? And then the prehistoric period also is defined as a society where they are illiterate. So there was no writing system there. That's why we use the term prehistory, prior to the presence of writing system. And then we have the historic period. The historic period is, a, is an epoch where the people started to have a local writing system, yeah? where the locals started to produce their own historical records. And for the case of Malay Peninsula, it started somewhere in the 14th to 15th century CE. The emergence of the historic period began with the foundation, the, began with the discovery of the Batu Busurat Terengganu, huh? the Terengganu inscription dated around the 14th century CE. So that is the period when we say that yes, there is a local written accounts in the Malay Peninsula. And the historic period really start with the development of the Sultanate of Malacca, where there were immense number of historical records. You know, that we have the Salalatu Salalatin, uh, we have uh, the Hikayat Hang Tua, as well as the Portuguese and the Chinese records, where the locals started to be able to, to write their own history. So the historic period really began in the Malay Peninsula after the year 1400. So we define this period based on the development of the Sultanate of Melaka, the Sultanate of Johor Riau, and the establishment of the modern Sultanate. However, the most complicated period in our history throughout our cultural development is the proto-history period. It is somewhere in between, you know, between the prehistory and history period. And it is the period when the local polity started to develop, when they started to take shape, and their form of statecraft start to take shape. Okay, so we need to have a look at this proto-history period, what really happened huh, during this time. Now, the rise of uh, this inter-regional trade okay, really began during the proto-history period. Okay? So the proto-history period can be defined as a phase of cultural development between the prehistory to the history period. It constitutes a transitional period when societies evolve 
from being an illiterate society to a literate society. Societies living in different parts of the world had different chronology and cultural characteristics for this period. However, as for the case of the Malay Peninsula, this period is defined as an epoch where intra-Asiatic trade started to begin, uh, as well as the advancement of the iron and bronze technology. Towards the end of the prehistoric period, the coastal and riverine settlement were already developed in the Malay Peninsula. You know, although there were no trade yet, but there were already coastal and riverine settlements. Yeah? And some even conducted trade with other prehistoric settlements. We have evidence that people maybe in the Hulu Pahang and Hulu Kelantan, they had trade with one another. And those areas were connected through the riverine network. Yeah? So uh, during the proto-history period, which spanned somewhere between the 5th century BC to the 14th century CE, ancient Kedah and Langkah Suka were the two dominant polities in the Malay Peninsula alongside with other lesser and short-lived polities. Based on the available archaeological and historical sources, contextualized by ethno ethnographical and geomorphological studies, several conclusions can be drawn regarding the economy, politics, and cultural traits of the proto-history societies in the Malay Peninsula. As far as the economy is concerned, based on our archaeological findings, we know that iron smelting and beet industry had already started in the Malay Peninsula from the 2nd to the 3rd century AD. You know? And this is based on the discoveries of the Kampung Sungai Ma site and the Sungai Batu archaeological complex, which can be dated from the 2nd century AD. So we know that during the proto-history period, industries had already taken shape in the Malay Peninsula. And at the same time, we know that there were also mineral and rainforest products which were sold to international traders. And the most important thing about the proto history period is the, pre the presence of long distance trans Asiatic trade. You know, somewhere in the late, uh, in the first or second century AD, there was a development of sailing technology in India and China. And as a result, the traders coming from these two regions started to arrive on the shores of the Malay Peninsula. So all these things had led to the economic development of the region. As far as politics are concerned, before uh, the year 500 BC, there were already, as I mentioned earlier, there were already uh, like riverine and the coastal settlements located in the Malay Peninsula, and they have been carried out and carrying out trade for quite some time. However, the arrival of foreign traders had led to the increase of uh, exchange of goods, okay? It led to the increase of capital, and this had led to the early urbanization of these communities. The early urbanization of the communities also led to the formation of coastal port polities and the establishment of tributary relation between these polities to other larger powers. You know, when there were lots of money, the social hierarchy started to change. So these societies, they evolved from a prehistory settlement to the form of polities with certain form of political configuration. And the result, the direct result of the, how do we say, the connection between the local population and the foreign traders had led to the process of acculturation, okay, where foreign cultures started to be absorbed into the local societies. And they also involved this kind of development of socio-technology where foreign technology were adopted by the locals. We can see this from the discovery of the Sungai Batu archaeological complex, where the iron smelting process were done by using the Blue Mary method. We know that Blue Mary method were used by the Southern Indians. So we can see the locals learn from the Indians on how to smell iron. Yeah? And we also see there were bead making industries. There was also an Indian technology. So the presence of international trade had led to technology transfer for more advanced societies into the societies in the Malay Peninsula. Uh, Dr. Rajan, yeah. if I may interject, there was a, a, a iron smelting industry in South India at the time too, also. Yes, uh, iron smelting industry in South India started like uh, 500 to 600 years earlier than earlier. Uh, the Malay They started even in 1000 BC. Maybe so by the time... Than, yeah. uh, than uh, uh, the earlier Kedah, yeah, in, in Kedah, it is somewhere around 200 AD. So, yeah, after they arrived, then we can see that the uh, iron industry started to develop here. It is due to technology transfer from South India. Okay. Yeah. 
jobs. And uh, they did not only involve in the technology transfer, but there was also the formation of local cultural identity due to this international trade. When polities started to take shape, when kingdoms started to form, so there were already formation of cultural identity. So the proto-historic period is characterized by these three uh, these three characteristics from, uh, in terms of economy, in terms of politics, and in terms of culture. And it became the foundation of the development of kingdoms after the 14th century CE. So we can see that the period of proto-history, it spanned quite a long period, you see, from the year 500 BC until uh, 1400 AD, almost 2000 years. But due to the lack of sources there, we were not able to narrate so much about the, politic, uh, the society condition during that time. But based on archaeological findings, then we can be able to make some summary regarding the characteristics. Yeah? So, uh, the rise of inter-regional inter trade, trade had led to the inflow of foreign communities and increase of economic complexity, which in turn triggered the process of urbanization, cultural diffusion, and technological exchange between the settlements and foreign traders. The whole process began in the 5th century BC meant that this settlement began evolving in from a prehistoric settlement to chiefdoms with certain form of political system. The economic stimulus which triggered the transition from prehistoric settlements into states and sustained the integrity of political system were the maritime trade. Thus, the social and political organization of these polities existed with the priority to maintain control over the flow of goods and commodities instead of direct control over lands of population. So that is the difference between a maritime polity and an agricultural society. So their priority is to control over the goods and commodities, you know, not over land. Thus, a maritime kingdom in most, uh, in most cases consisted of, local, uh, of coastal and riverine outposts with no clear land border, administered by merchant aristocrats and enforced by a strong sea bond armed force. The political bond between a dominant and subordinate settlements were, in, were involved coercing the subordinate settlements to pay regular tribute and give certain trade concessions to the dominant settlement. Direct political control does not exist in a maritime uh, in a maritime statecraft, and each settlement was usually administered autonomously so long as the flow of good benefits the dominant settlement. In the Malay Peninsula, the existence of separate lo local uh, polities started to be reported by the Chinese records yeah, since the 2nd century BC, while archaeological findings suggest their existence several centuries earlier. So the excavation in southern Thailand in Khao Samgyo led to the discoveries of quite a number of artifacts coming from India and China from the 4th century BC. So we know that the polities already existed far earlier, before the 2nd century CE. By the 5th century CE, these different polities began reorganizing themselves into a network of interconnected trade settlements, with the most economically important among them become the trade center. Okay, So it, it began somewhere in the 5th century. Uh, AD. So these are among uh, the important commodities locally produced in the Malay Peninsula. Alongside the natural materials, so we also have uh, iron, uh, raw iron as well as other, uh, other industrial technologies such as, such as uh, beads and uh, earthenware, huh, which were produced in the Bujang Valley. Unfortunately, yeah, there are several problems in interpreting the proto-historic maritime polities, their history. There are some problems. Firstly is the lack of written accounts. Most of the historical lit literature available to us came from oral accounts, such as um, Hikayat Merung Mahawangsa Altare Salah Silah Nabi Kedah. Yeah? Thus, the information needs to be dealt with caution and could at best represent how the locals view their ancient past. As for external sources, although they provide much help, they are far from being complete and is subject to a lot of bias also. Uh, and then for archaeological findings, uh, representing the local material culture is also very limited, you know, most of which consisted of uh, perishable materials. We have uh, archaeological findings, but most of them uh, were the result of trade. So we have Chinese ceramics, we have Hindu Buddhist temples, 
So most of them, you know, they were left by traders. So in addition, the rapid changes of geomorphological features at the archaeological sites, mostly consisting of coastal and riverine settlements, also destroy much of the remains. So we know that most of the settlements were located near to the coast and on the riverbanks. And we know that uh, because of this location, their geomorphological features change from time to time due to the rise of sea level, etc. So traces of this settlement were usually wiped out after two or three hundred years. Yeah? And due to this problem, much information regarding the culture and political system of pre-14th century maritime kingdom is lost yeah? and subject to speculations and conjectures. However, the Sultanate of Malacca, which succeeded the ancient Kedah as a maritime power, were well documented by the Portuguese, Chinese, and Malay texts. The abundance of written materials on Malacca give important insights into the political and administrative system, jurisprudence, economic, and trade, as well as court culture of the typical Malay maritime polity. Yeah? So such information can be important point of reference and comparison to fill in the gap in the research of ancient Kedah. So before the 14th century CE, before the 14th or 15th century CE, there was a large gap in terms of historical data on the proto-historic period of the Malay Peninsula. There was not so many writing system. However, after the 15th century uh, CE, the societies in the Malay Peninsula is better described due to the abundance of historical records. At this time, there were more writings by the locals, you know, especially we have the Salalatu Salalatin, we have Hikayat Hamtuah, we have Hikayat Raja Raja Pasai, which give very deep insight into the political and cultural makeup of the societies in the Malay Peninsula. And we also have reliable foreign accounts, such as uh, the Portuguese documents, as well as the Ming dynasty annals. So this information, they can be cross-referred with one another, and they are, they are, how do you say, the accuracy is quite high as compared to the proto-historic period. At this time, we know that uh, the maritime polities in the uh, Malay Peninsula existed as a confederation of coastal and riverine port polities, which I will explain after this. At this time, the economy was also based on industry and trade, like in Bujang Valley, and the royal capital served as a foci for the inter asiatic exchange network. So, uh, among the most important uh, historical records on Malacca, which give information regarding the form of a maritime state, is the Chinese records. So we have the Ming Shi Lu. So it gives detailed information regarding the court culture and the form of Malacca administration. And then we also have the Portuguese records, especially by uh, this Tomé Piresh and Duarte Barbosa. These two books give a detailed information regarding how Malacca expanded its power and the form of administration and the form of relation between the main part and the subordinate, subordinate groups. And then we also have the Malay historical tradition by Hikayat Hantua and Sejarah Malayu. They also can be cross-referred with other foreign texts. So when we speak uh, based on these informations, based on the information that we got uh, from the foreign records as well as the local uh, historical account, we can conclude that the Sultanate of Malacca is a confederation of coastal polities with its economic and political center located at the Malacca River. Yeah? Although Malacca existed only over a century, it became uh, the center stage of Malay historiography. The overwhelming attention was given to Malacca due to the abundance of historical sources, matters regarding the jurisprudence, court customs, administration, genealogy, as well as important events of the Sultanate were described in detail. So Malacca had often been considered as representing the height of a Malay culture, economic and political achievement. But detailed information regarding the taxation and port administration and could show possible parallelism with the ancient Kedah. So Malacca can be viewed as a telesocratic state which controls you know, which, you know, give lots of priority to control the movement and distribution of commodities. 
That is the one main reason why a telesecurity state exists. It is to control and uh, control the movement and distribution of commodity and wealth. Thus, the expansion of Malacca in terms of its empire, in terms of its power, meant having strategic control over coastal ports and settlements for trade monopoly. Yeah? And has less to do with territorial expansion. So that is the kind of statecraft that we have in a maritime uh, Malay politics. So for, for the pacified city-state, you know, I don't like to use the word conquer. You know, I prefer to use the word pacified. So for the pacified city-states, there were different uh, levels of political control from the main port. And uh, the, it depends on many factors. So the differences in terms of the level of political control was to have control over movement and trade over, over trade, trade and good, depending on the social and political condition of the side group. So we know that different settlements had different forms of military, had different forms of location, different forms of geomorphology, so they cannot have the same level of control over a large group of subordinate groups. So the, uh, the expansion of the Malacca Empire was aimed to control trade to the advantage of the Malacca main port. So uh, we have done some mapping yeah, on how the Malacca Sultanate was, uh, how you say, was divided in terms of its administrative system. Yeah? And we see that although the Malaccan Empire is quite large, it was administered and controlled differently for different types of uh, subordinate groups. Okay, there are five levels of political controls in the Malacca, within the Malacca Sultanate. So the areas which were directly ruled by the Malacca court was only the Malacca port. Okay, so it covers the area somewhere around the Malacca River, maybe a maximum up to the uh, Kesang River. That is the largest area, which is directly ruled by the by the Sultan. And then we have level two, the areas which is indirectly ruled by the court through Penghulu Mandulika. So we have areas such as Klang. Jugra, Linggi, and Selangor. Okay, so these were ruled by this pembesar which were appointed by the Sultan. And what are these areas have in common? These areas were the main uh, producer of tin. So the Sultan needs to have direct control over the, uh, the tin production areas so that it can be transferred to the port to be sold. And tin also was uh, used as their main currency. And then the third level are fifth granted to Melaka great nobles. Okay, and those are the areas with the most strategic position. So given to the pembesar who are loyal to the Sultan. So the areas such as Mua, Batu Pahat, Beruas, Manjung, Rupat, Singapore, Siantan and Bentan were given to the people like Bendahara, Temenggung and the Laksmana to rule uh, in the stead of the Sultan, you know, on behalf of the Sultan. And then we have level four. Those are autonomous kingdoms ruled by subordinate kings. So they were free to carry out their own matters, but they only have to follow certain laws of Melaka. For instance, they cannot carry out death sentence without the, without the consent of the Sultan of Melaka. And they also need to send over their produce to the Melaka port to be sold so that it can be taxed. And then finally, we have independent kingdom with only nominal allegiance to Melaka. Okay, those are like Kedah, Petani and Jambi. So they were only part of the Melaka empire or framework in name only. You know, they were not directly controlled by Melaka and maybe there were some trade agreements between the Melaka Sultanate and these empires uh, and this uh, kingdom. So we see there were five levels of control within the Melaka Sultanate and we believe that the same could have been uh, for ancient Kedah since the ancient Kedah also was a maritime based state. Now, When we want to speak about the history of ancient Kedah, we need to go to the sources first. Yeah? And uh, there were three, four main foreign uh, records on ancient Kedah. Okay? We have the Indian record, Arab record, Chinese and uh, Javanese records. Okay? So the Indian record gives important insight into the political situation of ancient Kedah. 
especially uh, the records by the Chola Kingdom. <coughs> uh, we know we we, uh, we call it the Leiden copper plates. So the Chola Kingdom clearly mentioned that Kedah was ruled by a king. We know that there was some sort of uh, monarchy in in Kedah. Yeah, whether or not the monarchy was based in Sriwijaya or was it a local ruler, it is open to it still open to interpretation, because in certain inscription it was said that Kedah. The ruler of Sri Vijaya was also the ruler of Kedah. So, but anyhow, we know that there is a, some form of political system in ancient Kedah based on the historical record, but based on the Indian record. The Arab record gave an important information regarding the extent of political control of ancient Kedah. It was said that Kedah covers the whole of the Malay Peninsula. You know, it was said that Sri Vijaya was divided into two parts in Sumatra and the Malay Peninsula, while Kedah is. The, on the peninsula part. So we can say you know, that uh, the extent of political control maybe covers from the Kra Isthmus down to Johor with the center being located in Bujang Vedi. And then we have the Chinese records. The Chinese record gave some information regarding uh, the presence of international trade in the Bujang Vedi. You know, the presence of Buddhist Tupas over there. So, you know, it, it can be cross-checked with uh, the archaeological findings in the Bujang Valley. Oh yeah, and I would also like to mention about the Arab records. It also says that in ancient Kedah, there was a multicultural and multiracial society there. You know, there were Indian traders, there were Arab and Persian traders, as well as Chinese traders there. You know, and this has been attested by the archaeological findings. And also, finally, we have the Nagara Kritagama, which mentioned, uh, you know, it, it made a passing comment about, the, uh, about Kedah and Jurai being part of the Majapahit Empire, you know? So all these uh, foreign records, the Arab, the Indian, the Chinese, and the Javanese record, it gives some info regarding uh, the society of Asian Kedah, but it was not enough to, for us to reconstruct the whole history. But those information helps, you yeah? However, we also have the local accounts, you know, uh, the Hikayat Meru Mahawangsa and Al Tarikh Salasila Negeri Kedah. So in the local accounts, of course, there are lots of narratives regarding the court life prior to the arrival of Islam, but they, this, it is very hard for us to cross-check the authenticity of the his, uh, stories. You know, we need some external sources to cross-check with them, but uh, we need to deal with this narrative with great caution. Yeah? So these are the examples of the Indian records, the Japanese records. Huh? And the most important, uh, uh, fire, how do you say, data, on ancient Kedah is the archaeological findings. Okay, so among the findings that we have are the structural remains, the inscriptions, tradewares, and icons. So these are the inscriptions which we found in ancient Kedah. Uh, and all of them were written by using foreign scripts. Those are clearly of Southern Indian scripts and Javanese script. Yeah, and uh, what, we can what see. Scripts, what, what do you call those scripts? Palava? Uh, some are Palava, some are Old Javanese. Okay. Yeah, so we have, uh, and all of them, they use Sanskrit language. We have not found a single old Malay inscription yet in ancient Kedah. Not a single one, you know? So it led us to believe that most of these inscriptions were either carved or brought in by traders. For instance, uh, this, uh, I mean, we can do at the silver disc here. They are written in the 9th century old Javanese script. 100% similar to those which have been carved at Borobudur. You know? So this, uh, the kind of script was found in uh, in central Java. So, and we know that somewhere in the 9th, 10th century, the Sarendra Pahu was very strong. So we were not surprised to say that there were Javanese traders somewhere in the uh, 9th to 10th century CE. And what, then we what, have the... What's the language, right? What's the language? The... This is Sanskrit. No, uh, language is Sanskrit. The, uh, yes, it used Javanese script, but a uh, Sanskrit language. Uh, the one that you refer to as in the Borobudur also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, for the Borobudur, for these inscriptions, uh, they simply mention the name of Bodhisattvas. It is not a long inscription, but it is Sanskrit. Yeah. And then we have uh, the inscription here. It is uh, written by using the Pallava script and Sanskrit language. Okay, it is dated around the 5th, 6th century CE. And uh, this is old Japanese, just a single character. And other Pallava scripts, all containing Buddhist uh, mantras. And uh, the inscriptions are mostly portable. Okay, and they were deposited beneath a uh, chandi to consecrate the site. Yeah, 
So uh, at this period, we have not found a local inscription written in a local language yet. Unlike in Sumatra, where we found lots of, you know, uh, Malay old Malay inscription, but we have not found any in the Mal in Bujang Valley or anywhere in the Malay Peninsula yet. You know, and also we have uh the chandis or the temples and uh, this is also subject to intense debate between scholars some believe that they were built by locals some believe that they were built by traders i believe that the both the locals and the traders built the temples since that ancient Kedah is a large and diverse region where traders have to live here you know while waiting for monsoonal change so some may have been uh, built by the locals but most of them i believe could have been built by the traders it is due to the fact that we found sites not only on the coastal areas, but to the interior of the Malay Peninsula also. You know, we have discovered lots of iron smelting sites in uh, Sikh, in Janyang and everything, but there was not a single uh, Hindu or Buddhist temple found in the interior of the Kedah. So most of the sites are located on the coastline. So it, it led me to believe that most of the sites were built by the Indian traders, you know? And these are the most important artifacts that we found you know and this artifact can pinpoint the presence of different ethnicities of traders in the Malay Peninsula uh, in Bujang Valley so we have Chinese ceramics we have Arab ceramics we have Indian ceramics and Persian uh, and Persian glasses so it shows that the traders in Bujang Valley they were very diverse exactly like Malacca you know and those are bits mostly were made in, in Shikadar and also we have lots of sculptures. So the, the sculptures are either crudely made. If they are, they are good sculptures, then they are small. You know? Many are quite portable also. And uh, the most recent discovery that we have uh, is the iron smelting sites, uh, which can be dated from the second century AD. And uh, they use Blumeri method, which I've published in Kajiam Nature. So it shows that uh, those were South Indian technology and they were adopted by the locals. You know. So the local learn, took the technology from outside and they chose Sungai Batu as the site for their iron smelting activities. And it is due to the abundance of iron ores in the area also. And this is another Buddhist site uh, found in the, the Sungai Batu archaeological complex. Now, prior to the development of Melaka, we know that Melaka only had the time span of 111 years from 1400 to 1511, and much is written uh, about it, you know, from all aspects of the, uh, of the Malaccan society. This is due to the fact that there were lots of written records on Malacca. The ancient Kedah is a different story. It had a development of 1,200 years. You know, Kedah poss possibly began in the year 200 and ended in the year 1400, but not much is written regarding uh, the socio-cultural makeup of Asia Kedah. It is due to the lack of written materials. So what we have are only the archaeological findings, which is open to interpretations. You know, we can't really know, we can't really be sure who actually made the Chandis and uh, how they reflected the material culture of the local. But one thing we know is that Kedah had a long span of development. And within this 1,200 years, lots of things happened. Yeah, And uh, why Asia Kedah had a long, long span of development? Okay, I think there are several factors which led to the uh, uh, ability of ancient Kedah to endure such a long period. Number one is due to the suitable geomorphological makeup. You know, because ancient Kedah had a very good coastline configuration. It was uh, initially uh, a large bay protected by Gunung Jirai. So lots of ships can be able to harbor near to the coast and protected from the strong wind. At the same time, it is located uh, at the entrance of the Strait of Malacca. You know, as compared to Melaka, Melaka was quite far from the entrance of like uh, from uh, from the entrance of the Strait of Melaka. So Kedah was located just at the entrance and just opposite the east coast of India. So it had a better geostrategic location. And then one more factor which led to the long development of Asian Kedah is the diversity in terms of its economy. Melaka usually focus only on international trade. We don't have any evidence for the presence of industry in Malacca. And because the Malacca's over-dependence on trade, disruption in terms of the trade route or some political problems in China or India could, this, uh, could lead to the fall of trade, you know, the fall of trade volume, and this can have political repercussions. However, things are different 
in in Chengkedah. In Chengkedah managed to diversify its economy, not only based on trade, but they also produce their own products. They also have their own industries. For instance, the iron industry. You know, even if international trade was not so good, then they still can be able to sell out their iron billets. At the same time, they also have their production of beads and earthenware. So aside from being the center for trade for you know external goods, they produce their own goods. Yeah. So that is due to this economic reason that ancient Kedah managed to sustain its development for a long period of time. And to top it all, we also have lots of natural resources. The iron product that we use, we use from uh, the iron ore mine from the nearby area. And we also have the Muda River, which was connected to the interior of the Malay Peninsula, which is very rich in rainforest products. So because all of these factors led to the development of ancient Kedah for a long period. Yeah? And how did ancient Kedah fall? It is due to environmental changes. You know, we know that somewhere in the mid 14th century CE, there was a lowering of sea level. The sea level uh, went down and due to that matter, uh, the Bay of Kedah started to seal up. And as a result, the ship cannot be able to harbor near to the coast and they cannot be able to sell their products. And it is because of that factor that ancient Kedah started to fall. You know, it is due to the environmental factor led to the economic collapse. See? So uh, this is the coastline of ancient Kedah before the year 1400. And there were several centers, you know, for instance, here, Pekalang Bujang is located over here. And uh, this is Kampung Sungai Mas, where the beach, uh, the big industry flourish and we have the Sungai Batu archaeology complex over here, you know. So ancient Kedah, instead of having a single center like Malacca, it has a multiple center with uh, specific purposes. Sungai Batu was to produce iron and we have Kampung Sungai Mas to produce beads and then we have Kampung Pekalang Bujang which become the main uh, international trade hub. So uh, ancient Kedah was more complex. You know, it also, even at the center of Asia Kedah, it consisted of confederation of different settlements with specific economic purposes. Yeah. So how do we define Asia Kedah? So we should define Asia Kedah on how we define Malacca also. Asia Kedah should be viewed as a confederation of settlements, of confederation of uh, different economic centers, you know, uh, for the benefit of a single part located in uh, Bujang Vidi. So we should not view ancient Kedah as a single centralized state. No, it should be seen as a collection of different types of a loof confederation of seaports of a coastal and refined outposts. Is this Where the Kedah, mandala system? Uh, yeah, there, there are several theories on that. Lah. So there are mandala system, there, are, there is a Bronson theory. So uh, I believe that, you know, to use the mandala system also is a bit complicated because the mandala system imply that uh, it, uh, imply that uh, the connection between the main part with the subordinate group is fixed. However, it's very loose and it can change from time to time. You see? And uh, the center for trade or the economic center can change also depending on the strategic reasons. You know? And where ancient Kedah was located, the, we believe that the main part is located in the Bujang Valley. You know, uh, between the Muda to the Merbuk River. It is due to the geostrategic location, but the political and economic influence could have covered the whole of the Malay Peninsula. You know, there are several production centers such as Kuala Selinsin. We have Berwas, we have Kuala Sangor. So even during uh, the late 16th century, Tomei Piresh had already recorded that Berwas used to be part of Kedah. You know, so we know that the Kedah political and economical influence could have covered the whole Malay Peninsula, or at least on the west coast of the Malay Peninsula. So ancient Kedah probably emerged during the, uh, during the early proto-history period, somewhere in the 2nd century AD, and then it declined uh, in the 14th century, maybe somewhere in the year 1370, as recorded by Salalatu Salalatin. And we can see that only 28 years after the fall of ancient Kedah, Malacca took over its place as uh, the main part of the Malay Peninsula. So the economic center kind of shift, shifted from the north to the south. You know, and uh, how significant was ancient Kedah to Malaysian history? Well, it is significant uh, owing to the fact that uh, there was a continuation of this maritime form of uh, political organization from the proto history period up to the Malacca Sultanate. So we, uh, we are talking about 1,500 years of history 
you know, of a different political organization which centered around the control of a movement of goods and trade, you know. So uh, the expansion for a political framework for a maritime state was not about the expansion of territory, but it was about the control over sea route. It is about the control over the movement of goods to the advantage of the main port. So the form of settlement for ancient Kedah, this is what we can, be, we can summarize now. Firstly, it is the confederation of different levels of coastal and riverine settlement. So at the center of ancient Kedah, we have the confederation of several production centers. For instance, Sungai Batu, Kampung Sungai Mas, Pengkalan Bujang, and maybe other sites like Kampung Simpul Tabang and Kampung Sireh, where there were high concentration of archaeological sites. Okay, so like I said earlier, there were economic center consisting of multiple trading, foresee, and production sites. And outside the center of ancient Kedah, there were several allied settlements, such as Kuala Selingsing. You know, we know there were, there were lots of findings in Kuala Selingsing, so it was probably part of the ancient Kedah network. We have police, you know, we found lots of votive tablets dated from the 9th century in police. And then we have Takwapa, you know, and other sites in Selangor, Beruas. So they could have been part of the Kedah framework where their role is to produce commodities and sell it in ancient Kedah, to submit their, their, all their commodities to be sold in ancient Kedah and to be taxed, so that ancient Kedah uh, can be able to make profit from the trade. And most of the subordinate settlements were located possibly along the west coast of the Malay Peninsula. I believe that on the east coast were controlled by Langkasuka, yeah? uh, which has been uh, written in a Buddhist text. It was said that uh, the East Coast was controlled by the Kingdom of Langkashoba and the West Coast by ancient Kedah. So, you know, the Malay Peninsula is divided into two parts. Okay, so this is the map of ancient Kedah. So this is the uh, political center, the economic center, while the rest is the allied settlements. You know? So as far as the demography and settlements of ancient Kedah, I believe that the population was not so much you know, because of the lack of agriculture. But, so they only consisted of some coastal outposts and riverine settlements. The political organization then, just like I've said earlier, uh, you know, they consisted of allied settlements while in within the economic center, within Bujang Vedi, there could have been some sort of ruler there. But uh, we don't have enough evidence for that. And economy, it was a mixed economy where trade and industry was uh, done simultaneously. And the external cultural stimuli, possibly the Indian culture could have influenced the local, but to varying extents, maybe to the uh, merchant elites, you know, uh, Indian influence could have been more prominent to them, but to the locals, I believe that they continued to be, uh, how do you say, they remain with their indigenous culture, being an animistic or whatsoever. We believe that uh, maybe Hinduism and Buddhism could have influenced the ruling class, but not. Uh, the rest of the population. And there were some characteristics of ancient Kedah which can be compared with the Sultanate of Malacca. In terms of economy, there were inter-regional trade link with Middle East, China, and India. Same with Malacca also. You know, this is clear from the records of Durati Babosa. And we know that uh, ancient Kedah had this connection based on the archaeological findings that we have. And also the export of metal and reference products. We know that Malacca exported tin you know, based on the, their control over Selangor, over Manjung and Bruas. So they exported tin, but for Kedah, we exported uh, iron. And then the, they derived much of their income by managing harpers and foreign traders. It is the same also with uh, the Asia Kedah. Uh, and then for the demography, it consisted of coastal ports uh, dwelt by foreign and native merchants and ruling, uh, ruling elites, the same with Asia Kedah. And the hinterland are uh, almost entirely inhabited by native population. Also, we know that based on the discoveries in Sikh and Janiang. And politic-wise, uh, there were a loose confederation of coastal polities, uh, the administrative system focusing on managing of port city and strategic relation with regional uh, economic superpower. So for ancient Kedah, they gravitate more towards our relation with Southern India due to the proximity, while Malacca, it gravitates towards China, yeah? So there are several, five conclusions uh, that we can make uh, based on our studies of ancient Kedah and our comparison with the Sultanate of Malacca. Number one is that the emergence of ancient Kedah was the result of early trans trade. 
you know, it began somewhere in 5th century BC and uh, continued up to the 2nd century AD when Malacca was established as uh, an international port. It existed as a loose confederation of port settlement, similar like Malacca, and there were settlements of foreign traders alongside with the natives, also same like Malacca. And then the, as for the main port, it was administered by merchant aristocrats and guilds. Yeah? And the economy was based on trade industry. So we can see the continuation of this kind of maritime state craft from the proto-history up to the maritime period and up to the modern period. So we hope that our further research uh, in the Bujang Valley can lead us to find, to, to discover more, more archaeological findings. There are still lots of answers. Our question remain unanswered. And we hope that in the future we can find at least one inscription written in local language, you know, to really push back the date of Porto history period in the Malay Peninsula. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, uh, Dr. Nasha. Uh, thank you for the uh, uh, fairly uh, perhaps a deconstruction of the narrative of ancient Kedah over uh, 1,500 year period. But I have one quick question before I um, move to a few questions which uh, I received. Uh, the language used, um, you said that, uh, again, I just want to certify and uh, determine the script is uh, Palava. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Palava and, and, and uh, Kawi and Jawa Kuno. Yeah. Jawa Kuno, yes. Jawa Kuno Kawi, the script. Yeah. The script. yeah. Uh, so over those uh, 1,500 year period, yeah. uh, until, until uh, 1,400, yes. uh, there was no Malay language identified not as uh, projected uh, in the script. Not a single, not a single word. Not a single word. I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm quite puzzled. Uh, no, in no, other no. words, uh, I, I'm thinking that uh, I'm sure that uh, Malay uh, was used in Kedah at that time, or, or perhaps uh, uh, you know, from the from early on, six, seven hundred uh, AD. Uh, but but then your your finding says that uh, the language was not Malay. Well, uh, my finding did not say that the language was not Malay. My finding showed that there was no written Malay at that time. So, yeah, we have not yet found a Malay inscription yet. Uh, yeah. what, what do you mean by written Malay? Because if, if you look at uh, the uh, Champa scripts, yeah. Champa, uh, the yeah. Chams, uh, as until the 16th or 17th centuries, uh, they were written in, in, written in, in Palawa. Uh, but the language is Champa. Yeah, yeah. So that's one one. So I, I, I'm, I'm just exploring the possibility, even if it's written in in, in Sanskrit or, or you know, in, in Palava, uh, the the language. Uh, and, and what what language was was there uh, manifested in, in, in those inscriptions? Uh, we because this inscription does not necessarily represent the spoken language in ancient Kedah, as I mentioned earlier, could have been brought in by traders. But I believe that yes, uh, I agree with you. It could have been Malay language spoken in ancient Kedah. Unfortunately, we have not found any inscription to attest that yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, you said two two scripts, eh? two scripts, Palava two scripts. and Sanskrit. And, yeah, and yeah, Palava uh, and uh, Old Japanese Kawi. Palava and Old Javanese. Eh? Yeah. Uh, and you said the language is Sanskrit. Oh, Sanskrit, yeah. Uh, what about Tamil? Pardon? What about Tamil? No, we have not found any, any yet. No not Tamil. Tamil. No Tamil, no. The Sanskrit that came to Kedah and to the Malay archipelago was basically, I think, Tamil Sanskrit. Oh. It was, uh, I mean, it was uh, you know, I would assume that it would be, it would be Sanskrit from South India. Uh, well, uh, because the inscription that we found in ancient Kedah were written by using the South Indian script yeah. and the Sanskrit. And but, but the Sanskrit, they consisted of a very short text. You know, those are Buddhist texts, Buddhist mantras. So there is no variation between, between North of South India in terms of that kind of language, you know. Because at that time, Sanskrit language has already been standardized. So we can't really tell the difference whether it came from South India or North India, you see. 
Yeah, but, but, we are, but, but we are sure that they are coming from South India because of the script that they based use. Based on this. geography and yeah, based yeah. on early context, yes, yes. Uh, the, the population of South India uh, would be more predominant uh, yep. with regard to early there, context. There is no question about that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. There is no question about that because uh, the, the scripts are clearly South Indian script. Those are the Palava ones. So, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, now, there are, there are a number of questions here. Maybe maybe you have to refer back to your slides. Hold on. Yeah, the first one. Uh, the three questions. Uh, this is how it's worded. What is your opinion of the roles of ancient Kedah? The role of? Ro role of ancient Kedah. Oh, ancient Kedah, okay. Specifically, and Malay Peninsula generally, in the trade routes, particularly the spice route, that was established uh, 5,000 years ago, according to this question. Well, uh, the, 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 the question is on the spice route. Okay, the, the spice route was, uh, for the case of the Malay archipelago, the spice route was only established earliest by 500 BC. That's the earliest already. 500 BC, yeah? Yeah, 500 BC, that's the earliest. So it is around 2,500 years. Mm -hmm. And ancient Kedah served as one of the stopping center. Lah. You see, so the uh, Kedah was not the only port in the Malay Archipelago at that time. There were other ports. So ancient Kedah was one of the many entry ports, which served as a choke point for the local rulers to exact uh, tax from traders. And at the same time, it was also the center where commodities are uh, gathered and sold off. So for instance, you can have Indian commodities and Chinese commodities collected in ancient Kedah. So people from India don't have to go to China to get Chinese commodities. So they just have to go to ancient Kedah. And Chinese, they don't have to go to India. They have to go to Asia Kedah. It is where all the traders meet together and uh, exchange okay. their goods. Yeah. Was there also uh, sorry, uh, uh, penarikan from, from, from ancient Kedah across the peninsula? Yes, of course. Yes, because along the, the Muda River, up to the upper Muda River, we found iron smelting sites. So there were settlements along the Muda River. So maybe they used the, uh, the river run network uh, from the west coast to the east coast. Hmm. You know, uh, from the Hulu Muda, it can be connected to the Yarang River. And Yarang River is the site for the Patan, uh, for Langkasuka Kingdom. Okay. So ancient Kedah is connected to the Kingdom of Langkasuka in the East Coast through the River Rhine network. And you it know, goes they don't have the to the Gulf around. Gulf of Siam. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, so they don't have to sail around the Malay Peninsula. They just have to use the River, river Rhine network to go to Langkasuka. So the, 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 the spice route was also connected to ancient Kedah, uh, yeah, yeah, say about 500 BC, as you said. Yeah, it's 500 BC, that's the earliest. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, uh, second question is, I think this, this question refers to the five levels mm -hmm. that you mentioned in your slides. Uh, it's asked in Malay, mengenai lima level hubungan dalam persoalan mereka, adakah level lima itu semacam alliance? Ya betul. Uh, saya percaya sebab kita uh, tahu yang level kelima ni berdasarkan kepada salah satu salah Latin. Okay. And then dikatakan bahawa uh, Sultan ke Raja Kedah tu cuma datang ke Melaka dan dia diberikan ubat saja. Jadi ya yeah, okay. diberikan ubat dia memohon ubat kepada so dia minta recognition lah kita kata it is a recognition and alliance. And saya rasa pada masa yang sama kemungkinan dia tu cuma nak dapat komoditi contohnya Melaka perlukan beras daripada uh, Kedah. Jadi dia macam apa nama some sort of agreement lah untuk monopolize trade beras dengan dengan Kedah. So kita rasa ya itulah. Dia tak ada political control, they are not bound by Melaka punya undang-undang. So hubungan tu mostly on economy basis. Uh, again uh, based on that, what language would the people in Melaka uh, and uh, use to communicate with the people in Kedah? <laughs> I think it should be Malay then. <laughs> <laughs> I mean the, the lingua franca uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it should be Malay then. Because Malay was spoken up to the crowd is So, yeah, it should be... Yeah, but, should... but again, uh, what evidence is there of the Malay language in Kedah? There is Apart none. from, from, from uh, I mean, uh, you said that there's no evidence. Uh, there is none, yes. Uh, because we have to use indirect evidence, you know, based okay. on the distribution of Malay language speaker, based on the distribution of the Astro nation speaker. So we assume that it was uh, Malay lah, but of course there is no hard evidence for that. Until we find proper inscription, then there is no evidence. Uh, okay, you, you, you said in your previous lectures, uh, some, some years back also, uh, uh, you use the word Australasian, the language yeah. of Australasian. 
Um, so it, it means to say that uh, the language spoken is a, a family of the Malay. I, I mean, when you say that this is this is a period of uh, perhaps one thousand five hundred years, or yeah. and there would not be a drastic change in, yeah, yeah. in the in the language spoken in the same area. Yeah. So I'm 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 not being being uh, trying to uh, establish a a, a, a bias uh, uh, a point, but I'm just trying to uh, get the narrative uh, in, in its perspective uh, in terms of the the, the glossia okay? uh, dominant uh, in ancient Kedah. Uh, although 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 mentioned and, and has been narrated that uh, links with uh, South India, uh, predominantly Tamil, uh, the Cholas were there, but uh, it, it could be a trade language. Uh, it, it may not be a, a, you know, the, the language of the dominant population. Uh, Dato, I would like to add something more. You know, we should yeah. not also rule out the presence of Mon Khmer speaker in Asia. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, we should not rule that out. So it could be a mix. It could be Malay. It could be Mon, the mix of Malay, Mon Khmer, you know? Because we know that the Mon Khmer, the population was up to southern Thailand in those days. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we should not rule that out. You're talking about the, the, the demography, the, the, yeah. the social yeah. demography. Yeah. So uh, also, also, also at that time, uh, the the Malay speaking population would also be up to uh, the 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 Kla Isthmus. In uh, other words, uh, yeah, you know, it's throughout the north of the prince, uh, the the Malay Peninsula beyond yeah. what we call Southern Thailand now. So I think there, there, there could be an overlapping between yeah, yeah, true. and Australasian. So there could be uh, a mix, mix uh, yeah. at, at the at the area. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is this is thing that uh, the other side of uh, apart from from uh, inscriptions. And there's another question. Uh, there, there are four questions we have, uh, we have got here. Uh, the question reads: uh, Lab procedures in determining the age of sample taken from Sungai Batu had given a dating of eighth uh, century BCE. What? Are the academic obstacles to establish the fact that ancient Kedah began in the eighth century BCE? Okay, when we speak about the carbon dating, huh, Dato, huh? Yeah, this is carbon dating, huh? Yeah, carbon dating. Okay, we have to remember one thing, you know. Uh, all radiocarbon samples need to be analyzed according to the Bayesian theorem. Okay, yeah. now we have 72 radiocarbon samples. 72 radiocarbon sample extracted from whole Sungai Batu and only one sample give that it. Only one sample? Only one sample give that old date, yeah? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so we need more samples in order to really accept the 8th century BC date. Currently, and also we need to look at the stratigraphic layer from where the samples were extracted. It need to show some continuation. So we have 7th century, 6th century, 5th century, so according to the layer. So the problem with this sample is that firstly, we had the 7th to 8th century BC and just one layer above, it is directly 2nd century BC. So what happened to the 400 years? So that's why there are some questions regarding this sample. Hmm. However, based on our analysis, we can be sure that 2nd century CE is the date where ancient Kedah really started because there were lots of samples dated from 2nd century. 2nd century CE? CE, yes. Ancient Kedah started? So when we look at the date before that, there were some problems with the chronology. We need more samples to really establish the 8th century date. However, when we go back to the theoretical and historical framework, the iron smelting technology only entered the Malay archipelago after the 5th century BC. That's the theory right now, based okay. on the study on the other side. So okay. it does, the, the 8th century BC does not go hand in hand with the theory and also the method to study the radiocarbon dating. Yeah. So we need more samples in order to confirm the 8th century date. So one single sample cannot be able to change the whole history of the region, you know? Okay. Yeah, yeah uh, you mentioned the iron smelting uh, industry in Sungai Batu. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, I, and, and you said that uh, you implied that it came from outside. It was uh, 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 an industry that was introduced from uh, outside of Kedah. 
But I said the technology was introduced from outside of Kedah, so the industry could have been local. Yeah. Okay. The, uh, so the industry was introduced from South India. Yeah. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, reading reading the narrative of the iron industry uh, in in Sungai Batu, it seems that uh, there is a disconnect. The narrative does not really mention uh, that. Uh, there is a, uh, an earlier existence or similar existence in South India in terms of the iron industry. In fact, uh, uh, in, in the sources it mentioned, but uh, uh, sources written by, by, by our scholars and uh, perhaps uh, you know, uh, uh, some of them, uh, many of them are, are narrated by, by the laymen, uh, interpreting from, from uh, people like you and others, uh, do not mention uh, the Indian, South Indian factor. Not that I want to emphasize, but I think that uh, historically there are, there were uh, iron smelting in India, in South India. So uh, the relationship between that and 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 uh, and uh, Indian Kedah. So also uh, other other questions like, for example, uh, uh, not uh, products derived from iron. Uh, uh, sometimes people ask, or oh, where 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 would origin from? Where would this say weapons or swords or it may be local in the, in the original from, uh, from 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 the peninsula? Yeah, but yeah. again, uh, we tend to uh, we tend to discredit or we tend to be silent on other uh, external factors. Yes, yes, of course, because you know the trans we call, I call it the trans Bengal trade. You know the trans Bengal trade already started from the fourth century BC. Fourth okay? century, fourth century BC, and this is uh, proven from the discovery in the site of Kausab. In, in near the Kra Isthmus, where uh, inscription dated from the 4th century CE were found. Yeah? So it proves that the, arrive and the uh, arrival of the Indian traders in, in the site of Khao Samgyo, they also brought in their technology. We, they were workshops of making portraits and everything by the Indian traders. Mm -hmm. So it should not be too surprising for us that in 2nd century CE, we have an iron smelting site located on the coast, just opposite the East Indian coast, developing here. You know, and the uh, Indian iron technology had begun far earlier. 1000 BC, they already have uh, iron technology there. And it was already well developed, you know. So uh, I am not surprised to see the transfer of technology. And at the same time, ancient Kedah was also very rich in the iron ore. So yeah, general, uh, it, was, it, it is natural for the locals to learn from the Indians to produce the iron beads by using the Indian technology of firing. So it shouldn't be too surprising. You know, we are located near to this how do I put it, or oh, this uh, industrial powerhouse, the ancient industrial powerhouse of mm -hmm. India. Mm -hmm. And definitely the technology is going to be transferred to the, to the nearby area. It, it shouldn't be too surprising. And also there are other iron smelting sites located in uh, Myanmar and Thailand. Yeah, yeah. Dated around, uh, also similarly dated to Sungai Batu, somewhere between uh, first century to second century. Okay. And they also use the Blue Mary Indian method. I see, okay. okay. Yeah, so, so uh, based on that, then that is how we came to the conclusion. So there is a similar similar site in the yes, West yes. Thailand and Myanmar. Yeah, it's Sri Shetra and Pandong Plong, if I'm not mistaken. Sri Shetra and Nong Taiwa, Nong Taiwa. It is somewhere in, in northern Thailand and in Myanmar. So those are iron smelting sites also. And the date is similar to Sungai Batu also. Similar to Sungai Batu, we say that about 500 years later than India. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay, yep. right. Um, I think this, this is one thing that, uh, you know, uh, the narrative of uh, uh, that centers on the peradaban Melayu. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, sometimes uh, you know, uh, it's related in, in isolation, or it's related uh, deliberately to uh, to suppress uh, uh, surrounding circum circumstantial factors. Uh, you know, this, you know, Prof. Yeah. I think one thing special about peradaban peradaban Melayu is our ability to absorb. External cultural features to our advantage. Okay. You know, that is uh, apa kita kata ke uh, apa nama kelebihan pada abang Melayu ni adalah kebolehan orang Melayu untuk menerima teknologi luar untuk pembangunan ekonomi tempatan. Kita tengok orang Melayu telah berjaya untuk mengadaptasi teknologi India untuk membuat tapak luar mesi. Orang Melayu juga telah berjaya untuk menerima teknologi India untuk membuat manik. So kita kata Melayu ni bukan satu bentuk budaya yang kita kata jumut tapi dia memiliki kebolehan untuk accept kebudayaan luar untuk accept teknologi luar. Okay. 
Okay, in, in your assessment, uh, yeah. are there cases in which uh, 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 the movement uh, counters uh, you know, the present trend? We, we say that there are Malay influences. I know that there are the Malays in Kedah, from Kedah, the, from the peninsula, have sailed to South India. It's not just a one-way movement. No, yeah, definitely. I mean, they definitely uh, have to sail to South India to buy the products. You know, and yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. They, so, they, they were big sailors. Yeah. You know, so, so I'm sure that long-distance trade were something normal for, for the local uh, local traders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. So, so meaning to say that there was, uh, it's normal for Malays from, South, from, from yeah. the peninsula and and the archipelago to sail to South India. Yeah, yeah, it is a two-way and thing. You know? and, uh, so, on. so it's a two-way traffic. Yeah, it's a two-way traffic. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, so uh, again, this is quite silent in our narrative. I mean, these are in uh, other narratives uh, yeah. from other scholars from outside, uh, especially in Europe. They would mention that, but not uh, among, among narratives here. Uh, uh, were there Malay influence or Kedah influence on uh, other parts of uh, the region? Other parts of the region? You mean outside the Malay archipelago? Yeah, outside the Malay archipelago, yeah. Oh, I haven't got the opportunity to study that yet, Prof. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering. Eh? Uh, uh, because uh, it, it's a two-way traffic uh, and uh, uh, there are mentions of it uh, with regard to certain artifacts, uh, perhaps certain technology uh, of uh, the Malays to, to India and, and uh, to uh, the proximity of the region. Uh, we have uh, another question here. Uh, what, in your opinion, what is the period that separates ancient Kedah and post ancient Kedah? Was there, uh, was there a Kedah Sultanate? Was the, was the Kedah Sultanate a direct successor of ancient Kedah? Okay. I think the thing which separates ancient Kedah with non ancient Kedah is the economy. Okay. Okay. And for ancient Kedah, the economy was largely based on trade and industry and centered around the Bujang Valley. Okay. However, somewhere in the mid 14th century CE, there was a, an environmental shift when the sea level started to recede. Due to the lowering of the sea level, the ancient Kedah port started to seal up. You know, the bay started to turn into dry land and, uh, the, and uh, trading vessels cannot be able to approach the coast anymore. Mm -hmm. So international trade started to, you know, started uh, to decline. This is what year? Uh, somewhere in the mid 14th century. Mid 14th century, okay, okay. Okay, and this is based on our geomorphological study. Yeah? Okay. So it means that the, uh, the port of ancient Kedah ceased to exist due to the lowering of sea level. Mm -hmm. The lowering of sea level had led uh, to the changes of coastline. The coastal configuration was no longer favorable for the development of a port. As a result, the international trade uh, ceased to exist. And then I believe because of these changes, ancient Kedah economy started to change towards agriculture. Mm -hmm. So there was a shift between uh, from an international trade in the 14th century to agriculture. Mm -hmm. And there is one important uh, account inside Al-Tareh Salasilah Negeri Kedah. Mm -hmm. And it was said that in the year 1370, mm -hmm. the Sultan of Kedah shifted his capital from Bujang Valley to the north. Okay. To somewhere near Sungai Kedah, uh, I think. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I think that is the uh, how do you say that is uh, the point where ancient Kedah ceased to exist, and we have the Sultanate of Kedah, which is located to the north, where with the economy was based on agriculture. So I think the thing which the main thing, the main difference between ancient Kedah and the Sultanate of Kedah is in terms of the economy, where the economy shifted from international trade to local agriculture, and it is due to the uh, environmental changes. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. So this differs from uh, the view of uh, Kedah historians in the demarcation between ancient Kedah and modern. Yeah. So so, they, 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 so we should use economy as a demarcation. You know. They 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 did not use economy as a demarcation. Uh, well, we should they, use they economy. Use, uh, yeah. Uh, just to 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 uh, you know to to give another view from them from the Kedah historians. Yeah. They gave the view of uh, availability of documents that state. Uh, dates. So uh, the Baro Mahavangsa and this, uh, another deity of Kedah, uh, the dates were only uh, uh, revealed or noted uh, in the 1500s. Okay. In other words, uh, uh, around about the 1400s, uh, there was no clear cut dates. 
uh, they got it from you know, uh, from other hikayats. But uh, when the dates are there, then only that was a demarcation for the modern Buddha. Prof, I think, uh, Prof, uh, when we speak about this uh, historical literature, there yeah. must be external sources which we can be able to cross refer them. Yeah. So we cannot base our uh, we cannot base the construction of our periodization on Kedah just on historical literature. We need to use other data also. Yeah, true, true. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so that's why I say that you know uh, we have we have lots of data on the economic demarcation. Exactly. Uh, in, in the distinction between ancient Kedah and uh, the Sultanate of Kedah. So we have the geomorphological data, yeah. we have the archaeological data, and we can cross refer them with Antares Salah Sirah Negeri Kedah. So the data was quite clear. So just by using the historical uh, the historical literature text, I, I don't think that is appropriate. <laughs> true, true. I think your, your, your finding and your interpretation should be a, a valuable contribution uh, to the study of the uh, Sejarah Kedah and uh, to those uh, Kedah historians. <laughs> Uh, who, uh, uh, are, uh, who are using these texts to demarcate. I mean, in other words, uh, we have to use many factors. Yeah. Uh, uh, doc uh, documentary, uh, uh, the climatic factors, uh, environmental factors, economic factors uh, that, that inform us of the differences. Um, okay, so uh, I have... Uh, yeah. Oh, there's there's another question. Um, the wolves and harbor masters were dated fifth, uh, sixth century BCE. Does can it relate as a continuity to the iron smelting site of the eighth century BCE? This is the First question. of all, uh, when it comes to the date. Uh, it is still uncertain uh, because, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the 8th century BCE date is just based on a single carbon dating result. Okay. So we need more samples to be analyzed. I'm not saying that the date is wrong, but I say that we need more evidence to say that Kedah, uh, the date for ancient Kedah development was earlier than 2nd century CE. I say that we need more evidence. And as far as the date for the wharfs, there's also some problem because they were using the thermoluminescent dating where you know uh where it is the accuracy can still be questioned you know the accuracy of the thermoluminescent thing so to say that it is fifth to sixth century bce is a bit too early prof you know okay but, century, uh, yeah. but the sungai batu uh, uh findings uh indicate that the iron smelting was already there uh, uh in the fifth bce uh yes uh the, the fifth bce is uh the, the single date uh, it's it's the 2,500 years ago. That, that. Yeah, but, but, the, but the date of 500 BCE, no, it is based on one or two samples. It's not enough. We need more evidence to say that it is dated earlier than 2nd century. Is so it, we cannot we put, conclude that, I mean, there, there are a number of views early on that, that uh, is inclined to conclude that uh, Kedah civilization uh, began uh, 2,500 years ago. I don't think so, Prof, because I say yeah, that the, the oldest civilization in South Asia. Whether it is oldest or not, we need to base our argument based on data. Okay. And uh, we did some Bayesian analysis on the radiocarbon samples. And the most convincing date for now is to uh, 2nd century AD. 2nd century, yeah? 2nd century. So about because, uh, 2,200 years back. About uh, 1,800 years back. 1,800 years back. Huh? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm not saying that, that 500 BCE is strong, but I say that we need more samples. We need uh, more samples to verify the date. So just based on one or two samples, radio, radiocarbon samples is not enough. But like I mentioned earlier, we extracted 72 radiocarbon samples and mm. only one or two give the date any earlier than uh, 200 BC. You see? Meaning, meaning the, uh, the, the archaeological site, uh, you know, the uh, smelting sites, uh, and the, uh, uh, you know, the, the Chandis uh, in Sungai Batu, uh, can be dated as far back as that. Uh, it can be dated as far back as 2nd century, but so any earlier than we need more evidence for that. As far as 2nd century, okay. okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to, of course, it's uh, older than the Borobudur and Angkor Wat. Yeah, definitely, yeah. It's definitely older than Borobudur. Uh, but we have to bear in mind that uh, 5th century BC, there's no enough evidence yet. One or two samples is not enough. You see, we need more samples, we need more excavation, yeah, and uh, to, to verify the date. But would that uh, would would, would uh, the evidence that you have now, yeah, um, can be sort of uh, fairly conclusive in terms of to relate that 
to uh, subsequent developments leading to the Borobudur and then so on. Uh, with regard to uh, cultural evolution, with regard to uh, you know, the belief systems and so on. Well, I see that the development of Borobudur in Central Java and the development of Asian Kedah is are two separate matters, Prof. Okay. Yeah. They are two separate matters because yeah. they are totally different in terms of the economy, economic substructure, the society is different, okay. the nature of statecraft is different. So Borobudur and Asia Kedah are two different issues. Two you different know? entities. Then. Yeah, two different entities. They, I, I don't think they are even related culturally. You the Shalindras are, totally... are not related to the people in Asia Kedah. Uh, pardon? The Shalindras, the ones who built the Javanese dynasty. Uh, it, it is open to intense debate, Prof, because the, uh, we have evidences and that is how we see the written records. You know, people, uh, We have the same evidence. If you see, see it from, from different point of views, then you are going to get different implications. It is, you know, for the proto history period, that is the problem. You know, when there are not so many data, it opens to different interpretations and there are many strands or narratives. You see, so regarding the origin of Salendra, etc., you know, uh, those are philological debate. So for for PPAG, for the Center for Global Archaeological Research, we would focus on our scientific research and how the scientific research can give us information regarding the culture, the develop, the cultural development, and the chronology of the societies here. So for for the, for the philological research, I would leave it to the experts. Huh? <laughs> yeah, even Salendra are. Uh, uh... Uh, not certain where they come yeah, from. Yeah, not certain. So some people believe that they came from Sumatra. Some people believe that they came from Java. So there are lots of opinions on this. Yeah, yeah there are many, many uh, writings. And I think the latest one is in the uh, Journal of Indonesia, the only world. On, on, uh, quite conjectural also. Uh, yeah, yeah, many of them are quite conjectural. So class. it is better for us to stick to the things that we know we are from. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, would you say that uh, uh, one can, can can we well I'm not saying we do establish but can we uh, sort of uh, we can assume historically that uh, uh, Kedah ancient Kedah is one of the uh, maritime uh, centers uh, in 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 Malay civilization. In Malay There's no civilization. doubt about that. You know we say that the proto historic period period of the Malay Peninsula is dominated by the development of ancient Kedah. Okay, okay. From the 2nd century AD until the 14th century CE, 1,200 years is a long period of time, Prof. Okay, and we are amazed to see how Asia Kedah managed to endure the development of, of this long period of development. And I pin it on the economic speciality of Asia Kedah, where they, they diversify the economy, they can maintain, they can sustain the development, you know. There are rough times, but it is due to the presence of industry that Asian Kedah can be able to endure yeah. for 1,200 years, while Malacca can only last for 100 years. Yeah. Okay. I, I, put, I put it on the economy. I have two, two other questions. Uh, yeah. If there are no questions, I want to ask you this, these two questions. Um, during that time, uh, what was the role of the sultans of Kedah? Uh, during Asian Kedah? Uh, I mean, we're talking about the period of uh, from the 10th century to the 14th century. In other words, uh, uh, details are not are not uh, you know, are not visible as such, but there's a list of the sultans of Kedah. What what will be their roles and presence? Okay, uh, first period? of all, the list of sultan of Kedah, as we get it from the Altare Salasila, Negeri Kedah. Yeah. yeah, those are the only materials that we have. You know, we we don't have any external sources to cross check them. You know, uh, for the period before the 16th century CE, but if the list is correct. Then uh, the rule of the Sultan of Kedah should be similar to that of Melaka also. Okay. So the Sultan of Kedah should be uh, the, uh, play the role as a merchant aristocrat. So he should have his capital near to the coast where he control most of the trading activity and for this, for Kedah case, also the industry. You see? So it, it should be, revolve around money making. Any and, documentary evidence? Yeah, uh, yeah, that, that, that merchant aristocrat. Yeah, true. Yeah. Uh, which is uh, also the, the case... Uh, in, in, in the uh, late modern period, uh, 1800s. Uh, are there any, any documentary evidence uh, to show uh, the involvement of the Sultans in terms of their, their stake on, on territory and on, on the economy? Unfortunately, for Asia Kedah, no, we don't have any. So those are just conjectures. We don't have the, we have not found any sources on that yet. But we can be able to conjecture based on the political structure of Melaka, based on the economy of Asia Kedah, then we can know that uh, the presence of a ruling class was to maintain wealth, was to extract as much wealth as possible. And the only way is to maintain control over trading activity. 
Okay, my last question. Was there any uh, evidence, documentary or otherwise, uh, of the influence of uh, ancient Kedah on, on, on the formation and the evolution of Malacca? Because oh. there seems to be a, a, a sudden shift uh, yes. from, from yes. Uh, a, 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 a polity, a system to the uh, Malacca Muslim Southern. Okay, I don't believe that there were any influence, but uh, due to the similar forms of economy, due to the similar dynamics in terms of the settlement and demography, naturally the political system should be the same, you know, because they are all maritime state, they have the same purpose, so definitely the political is the same. I don't think that uh, Malacca was the continuation of Kedah, but okay. the similarity was due to the, uh, the similarity in terms of the political system because they share the same form of economy. Yeah, but the Sejarah Melayu mentioned Kedah and Bros uh, uh, in, in the text. Uh, okay, well, one more thing, which I'm curious. What, how, how do you describe the, the religion uh, in ancient Kedah at the time? I know that uh, certain terms are used. How accurate would, they, would it be? And how appropriate, how, how do you appropriate uh, okay. the vocabulary and, and, and the term of, of whatever religion that they Okay, if, uh, bef uh, during the period of ancient Kedah, I believe, I believe that there were many sections there are many different sections within the Kedah society, you know. There were the foreign traders, there were the ruling native merchants, and then there were also the lay people. So possibly a small number of the ruling elites in ancient Kedah were influenced by the Hindu or Buddhist religion. A small number of them. Mm -hmm. While the rest still maintained their old religion, you know. And at the same time, the uh, this was due to the connection between the ruling elites with the foreign traders consisting of Indian traders or Japanese traders. But most part of ancient Kedah, I don't believe that they were really Hindu Buddhists. I believe that they were, you know, animistic in nature. What about in the period of uh, from the 9th century to the 14th century? Yes, what I'm talking about that period. I'm talking about that period. Yeah, yeah. I, I speak. I say that uh, minori uh, only the uh, minority of uh, people in ancient Kedah believe, uh, I mean, adopted to the Hindu Buddhist religion because the discovery of Hindu and Buddhist materials were only, uh, how do we say, limited to the areas near to the coastline. Mm. And in the interior, we have not found a single Hindu or Buddhist uh, monuments, not even artifacts. Okay. So possibly it is the merchants and the ruling class who were influenced by the Hindu and Buddhist religion, while most people in the interior possibly were still maintain their own religion. Uh, how how would you describe their own religion? Is it Islam? Uh, it could, it could be animistic. Uh, it could be in animistic in nature, just like the religion of the Orang Laut or the Orang, or the Orang Asli. Okay, what about Islam as a as a religion? Islam, you know, we have records regarding the presence of Arab traders somewhere in the 9th century okay. in ancient Kedah. They could have been here earlier, also. Yeah. Maybe by the seventh century, it should be here. Yeah, yeah. But to what extent did Islam influence them? Then we don't have enough evidence on that yet. Okay. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I've been reading some uh, uh, some uh, terminology uh, used in, the, especially on on the words used to describe time, and uh, a number of them are derived from Tamil or Sanskrit. Uh, as, as understood uh, in Kedah, not only in Kedah, but in, in Kedah. So I, I suppose that that will be, uh, you know, uh, a strong influence of Tamil and Sanskrit uh, terminologies, uh, where, you know, the, the word jam uh, comes from. <laughs> uh, I, I wrote it, I, I, I mean, I, I, I source it from Asma uh, But again, uh, uh, that, that, that period, that, that, that uh, Muslim period, Okay, what, what, you, what you've given is a narrative which, which is uh, not in consonant with uh, other historical narratives uh, are given by other historians. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Kedah historians, the Satwa Zarak Kedah, and also other historians with regard to that, that layer of Islam uh, dominating Kedah society uh, from, from the 10th century, uh, onwards, okay. so uh, uh, this this will be uh, perhaps a, a, maybe a, a point of debate uh, from different disciplines. 
Yeah, for, but we need hard evidence for everything, you know, but because I speak only based on the archaeological evidence that we yeah, have yeah, at hand. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. that is the best that we can give maybe, based on maybe, whatever yeah. data that we have, you know. Maybe we can have a, a forum also, okay? yeah. uh, putting uh, archaeology and history, especially with regard to Kedah uh, historians. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, perhaps in the near future. I, I'll give you the Kedah the, the history uh, poster. Okay? Uh, all right. Um, let me see if there are any other questions. All right, we don't have. We have, uh, uh, I think in, in, in the, uh, in, in this link we have six, but in, in YouTube, YouTube we have uh, uh, about, let me see. Yeah, uh, almost 30. So uh, I hope that, uh, we, we benefit from this course uh, and uh, we note uh, problems of uh, evidence and uh, uh, of arriving at conclusions. But what's important here is that uh, the, the structure on the, on the uh, ancient Kedah has a maritime quality uh, can be seen uh, from various perspectives. Uh, uh, and, and, and again, if I if we read Andaya, for example, uh, Andaya would give yet another perspective uh, to the to the uh, maritime dimension of Kedah and the peninsula. Okay? He was talking about the Penarikan, he was talking about uh, the Arab uh, naming and the nomenclature at the time. Uh, with that, we, uh, we, we end this session and we thank uh, uh, Dr. Nasha for his uh, research and for his study of uh, Kedah, uh, uh, giving insights into uh, ways of measurement and, and uh, also perhaps uh, will be useful for uh, a variety of perspectives that people hold and believe in. Uh, and thank you also to uh, uh, those who are attending uh, this uh, uh, session, uh, lecture nine, uh, of the Tanah Air Malay Maritime Project, and we will continue with this uh, uh next month uh, until uh, December. So we'll have uh, uh, different views. Uh, in a way, uh, bearing in mind that the, the overall uh, objective is to uh, redefine Malay maritime civilization. And the Malay here uh, you know, uh, can be uh, Hindu Buddhist as well. We're not we're not uh, uh, using the uh, definition of the federal constitution, uh, uh, legal definition of the Malay. We're using uh, uh, an ethnic anthropological definition of the Malay with regard to the Malays in reference to uh, those in South Asia or, or the Malay Palico, which who are normally Muslims, but there are groups of Malays who are not Muslims uh, uh, in, in in this region. So with that. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Nasha, for your time. Uh, and uh, uh, we hope to uh, call you again in some other, uh, uh, for some other topic uh, uh, from Istek. So uh, uh, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum. Thank you.